Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm Martin Rogers. I would like to welcome you all to this morning service. I hope that you will enjoy what has been prepared for you this morning. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm Vivianko Arantza, and I'll be reading out of Genesis 45, verse 1 to 15. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. While Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, and he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom he sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did not send me, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in, la in the land, and yet there are five years, in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you and posterity in, in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of his house, and the ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt, come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that thou hast, come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And he shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen, and he shall haste, and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren, and wept upon them, and after that his brethren talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Rabbi Answer. Today I'll be reading Romans 11 verse 28 to 32. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so, have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy? For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends, good morning and welcome. Martin Rogers has already welcomed you, and both Vivianco and Robin have done our readings. Grace and peace to you on this 143rd day of lockdown. Let us pray. Lord, inasmuch as the Israelites were in bondage and in exile, we too are in exile and we long to be delivered. We long again to worship in the temple, to be together. Bless us as we anticipate that day. Bless us now as we open your word to reflect. Amen. Like the storerooms of Canaan, are your spiritual storerooms empty? Is the geestelike voorraad van jou store en skiere leeg? You know, I never enjoyed history at school. It was just too much about the dead. 
But nowadays history intrigues me. And the continuous reading in the Old Testament has really been very surprising. We were introduced to Joseph a few weeks back. And now we are with Joseph again. We passed his Technicolor dream coat and his reading and his dreaming and that Joseph was sold into slavery. There's much we can take from this lesson of Joseph. He became a powerful man, well placed in civic society and politically. I wish I could say to the length and breadth of our House of Parliament and the union buildings that when you're in power, you are called to serve and not to be served. Picture the following. Imagine Joseph being our Minister of Agriculture and our present government. Imagine our grain stored in silos the last few years have done well and stocked to capacity. And now we are facing a time of famine and drought ahead. Now imagine wakening up to the news that our grain stores are empty. The grain stores in the Western Cape, in Swellendam, in the Free State and in Western Transvaal, these are all empty. And we say to ourselves, but this is not Somalia, this is not Kenya, this is not Zimbabwe, this is South Africa. How can our stores be empty? Imagine the shelves of our malls being empty. Similar to Zimbabwe, which I witnessed last year. This is not only the reality of lockdown, but the real famine of the magnitude we could never imagine. And so imagine the Minister of Agriculture together with the Guptas and Ace Magashula and Moseben Zizwan and Anuj Singh have siphoned up all of our wheat and grain and sold these to enrich themselves. I ask you to imagine this. It's not far-fetched. It's happened. The level of corruption in our country is scary. Why would you loot local shops and shabins and bottle stores when you can steal millions? We wait for those who have been fingered, those who have been named to be prosecuted. So with Canaan facing this famine, Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to buy grain because he heard about the word van oorvloed in Egypte, with good reason. The foresight and wisdom of Joseph. Joseph who dreamt that his brothers would bow before him. The same Joseph that was thrown in the well. Joseph sold into slavery. Joseph who spent the world time in the wilderness to realizing how long he was and will come back to this. Joseph who chose to serve rather than be served. Is this the same spoiled and much hated Joseph? Die een op die broers neergekyk het, neergesien het. Wat een gedaante verwisseling. Hy kom nou in hoofstuk 45 en vers 7, hy sê, God has sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on earth, to save your lives by a great deliverance. One that has been wronged, he says, God saved me so that I could deliver you. We are told that the brothers did not recognize him, but Joseph recognized him. Joseph sells them the grain. He accuses them of being spies. And, um, and he threatens them. Reuben in defense explains and says, No, no, no. We are only 12 brothers. We are your servants. There is one more brother at home. And then there is one more brother that is no more. Joseph still weighed heavily on his mind, if not the others. Because why mention Joseph years after Joseph is no more? To say one is no more is to admit that person is gone, is deceased, is forgotten, is not around anymore. But no, for Yosef will have actually sat a silver copy, he puts a silver mug in each of their bags to accuse them of stealing and now he says you need to bring back your younger brother and your father. And of course they are, they are terrified. And they say to Jacob, Jacob says, I've already lost one brother, Joseph. I'm not prepared to lose Benjamin, my other son. And they can't to stem and hear that they can The story of Joseph runs like one of those, those 
um, classic movies like Ben Hur and Sound of Music that you can watch again and again and again. It has a happy ending. It is a real tearjerker. We read in verses 14 and 15 that Joseph embraced his brothers. He cried. He was emotional as he kissed them for the long lost time. God has sent me ahead of you to preserve you and to offer deliverance. He does not dwell on the past, on the hardships. He doesn't talk about the life under slavery. Joseph chooses to be obedient to God. He does not hate. He promises to care for them. He showers them with love and hospitality. He gives glory to God. I hold no grief for our modern day politicians. When South Africa borrowed the billions from the International Monetary Fund, the government was told, do not steal the money. Can you imagine the indictment? I'm borrowing these billions, but do not steal the money. What message does this say about our justice system? You will be convict, convicted for stealing and looting, but if you steal millions of money from the VBS bank that belongs to the poor, if you steal money and groceries that was meant for the poor under lockdown, if you embezzle millions from Transnet and SAA and or the Estina Farm Project, and as long as you're politically connected, you are safe. Can you imagine? For a loaf of bread, you will be sent to Paul Zimmer, but not for millions. Can you imagine the state of the grain silos in Egypt if any of our current politi politicians were in charge? The heilige swaar kreis sal niks wees in vergelijking nie. At least they had Egypt to go to. We would have nowhere to go to. And at this end leave the untouchables, hulle kinders en familie in hierdie land voort. I'm saying these things because churches across the Cape Metropole and across the country today have been asked to draw attention to the state of corruption in our country and to say enough is enough, enough is enough. And so we want to support the South African Council of Churches initiative in this regard. But back to our text. I was intrigued and admi I admired the, the, the fortitude, the courage and resilience of Joseph. This was a man more than just wisdom and foresight and courage of his time. In order to understand and get a better picture of Joseph, you had to read the preceding chapters. When Reuben returned to the cistern, to the empty well, to look for his brother, they tore his clothes. Joseph was no longer there. Where has he gone? He turned to his brothers and said, what have you done? But Reuben is complicit. He's not innocent in this. There was a sad um, aftermath in many of the brothers' lives. Read about that from chapter 38 onwards. The account of Judah and Tamar um, and all of the other sad incidents. The wages of sin is death and they were not exempted from that. We, we don't know what happened to Joseph after he had been purchased, bought by the Midianite merchants uh, and later sold to Potiphar, a senior official, uh, under Pharaoh. We, nothing much is said. But we remember the young man, young boy of 17 years old, hated, rejected, completely forgotten. Because remember, this is hierarchical society. Joseph was the youngest. Joseph had to respect the older brothers, his siblings, but instead he runs to his father and he says what they have done out in the field. That was not on at all. But after that, Joseph finds uh, favor in the eyes of all those he comes into contact with. Despite the, the event with the shrewd Potiphar's wife that got Joseph into trouble, Joseph continues to shine. Because we are told that the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and gave him success in everything he did. And Joseph found favor in the eyes of his master. The Lord was with him and showed him favor. Later on, Pharaoh had a dream. Nobody could explain the dream. And eventually they said, there is a young man in prison. And eventually they get him out of the dungeon, out of the depths of the prison. And Pharaoh, Joseph led a dream from Pharaoh 8. 
And Pharaoh says, the spirit of the Lord is on him. Though I am Pharaoh, though I am in control, you shall be in charge. Without you, no one will lift a hand or foot throughout Egypt. And in fact, everything Joseph did literally said, I fear God. I stand in awe and reverence of God. I venerate God. I fully rely on God. And now we meet up with him at the reunion with his brothers. Devere sin. Imagine the tears. The tears of sadness. Tears of relief. Tears of remorse. Maybe tears of guilt. Tears of fear maybe. But those became tears of joy. Joseph was alive. Like the prodigal son. Joseph was alive. He came back. Joseph says, the Lord preserved me for a time like this. Joseph was born for a time like this. He discovered his calling. He discovered his calling. Think about this. Joseph's nine to five job was running Egypt, meeting, discussing um, 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 foreign affairs, looking at the internal matters, making decisions and all that is necessary. But he also realizes his calling. You know your 9 to 5 calling. You know where you clock in and clock out every day. Your vocation and your calling is over and above that. Remember your calling you cannot see outside of God. You cannot after finishing at school now be done with life. There is more to life than just a 9 to 5 job. More to life than that. You need to discover your calling. Whether that is playing the organ, teaching Sunday school, being with a pre-con or the confirmations, being with one or other organization, we, we need to discover God's calling on our lives. I need to discover God's calling on my life. If not, if the story of Joseph was just a simple, simple lesson in history, then it might as well have been as modern day soapy or modern day serial, where the story just continues and continues with no lesson behind it. Darle, it's deeper. And it was difficult. It doesn't say outright, it doesn't say it at all. But, you know, it came to me very in the early hours of Friday morning as I prayed over this text and as, as I reflected. Yusuf was bedarf as a lot, Lamiki. He was good at interpreting dreams, but there was very little respect for his, for his elders, for his brothers. So he was sold into slavery, and we're not all proud of Mikuti. We're not, we're not speaking good of that at all. Nothing is said about Joseph and his time with the Midianite merchants, or after that, other than he was in prison and that the Lord was with him. But one needs to realize. Joseph was shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. There the hand of God touched him and he was no longer the same. Can you believe that? He was no longer the same. How else can we explain his change and growth in this time, in his time of exile? He did not live with pity, resentment, bitterness or anger. Just like the prodigal son, Joseph came to himself. He had to say, Sinna Kakum. Mach ons ook so to ons Sinna Kum. May we come to ourselves, to our own, even under lockdown. There had been much hurt, loss, bereavement, unemployment, hardship under lockdown. We miss seeing each other. We miss togetherness. We miss worshipping and praying and singing together. We miss embracing and being, being embraced and to hear again, Jesus loves you. Remember the lessons on the lockdown. Remember the prayers we prayed. Think of the fear and isolation and death. It will soon be time to praise and worship God again. As meaningful as the life of Joseph turned out, 
I pray for the renewal of our worship. We can only do so by restoring the integrity of worship. May our song also be shackled by a heavy burden. Neath a load of guilt, of guilt and shame. There the hand of Jesus touched me. And I am no longer the same. Something happened and now I know. I am no longer the same. Lord God, guide us and bless us as we seek your face. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit remain with you.